Hey guys, Ace of Vegas here, and I hope you're doing well, and welcome back to another episode of The Casino. So basically the recap is, we had some high roller drama, singer drama, blah blah blah, no mention of the swingers from last episode, I think they've gone the way of the frat boys, and that's okay with me. I'm really only starting to look forward to the remix version of Two Shots, because that jam is banging. Rolling the dice, not always a winner. But hey, even Avatar The Last Airbender took about three or four episodes to get a good formula down. Maybe a third time's the charm. Here's episode three. It's the Ace of Vegas, the Ace of Vegas. So we open with a young woman talking to a grandma and... Hey grandma, I'm almost there. I can't wait, I'm so excited. Uh, why does she have a name card? So this is Jen. Jen is apparently moving to Vegas from nowhere, Kansas or east of Egypt, or some other random place where they have cowboy hats in red. I think she said she's from Portland. She's also a brain surgeon in training, clearly, because she thought it would be a good idea to take a week's worth of money to Las Vegas and try and get a job from there. And yeah, this was filmed before the real estate bubble burst, so I guess it was probably a cool idea at the time. But of course she decides that she's going to be staying at a casino resort instead of a sensibly priced motel, or perhaps with friends, while she applies for a job. She straight up states that she has no plan, hasn't done any cold calling, internet applications, or research of any kind. I guess the whole shtick is that she's pretty and naive. So much so that the valets and the bellmen trip over themselves trying to get her bags. Oh, I got, I, I got this! Thank you guys. Right, right this way. More on that later. Can I interrupt for a second? Meanwhile, we finally get some casino operations. It appears as if Tim and Tom have a lead on another set of Vegas High Rollers. They have generic names, John and Mike, and I guess they play poker. Though, to the show's credit, these might not be their real names. Often, casinos have a practice of calling their High Rollers something else. Mr. B, or something to that effect, to protect their privacy. It's not elaborated on, but it's a neat little flourish there. I'm glad that they went with just first names instead of full names like they did with the Mills family. That's actually really clever. So, the challenge today is harpooning more whales that prefer to swim on the strip. Okay, cool. Looks like Tom might be taking this seriously. He sets up the Cadillacs to drive them in, and preps the best room in the hotel to change Mike and John's minds. Now we get to see how downtown competes with the strip, given that they don't have the volcanoes, the pirate shows, etc. Though nowadays the strip doesn't really have pirate shows and the volcanoes only going off... Well, not very often anymore. So maybe what Tom did actually worked. In this instance, the play works well, and our whales for the episode, John and Mike, are not impressed with the nugget. Are you kidding me? First off, they say downtown is a little seedy. They don't really like the look of the nugget and aren't excited about being invited. Even though they were complaining about how lame the Venetian was or something. Secondly, it isn't as posh as the strip. The view in their hotel is very Lion Kingy, and I'm not talking about Circle of Life, we're talking like Elephant Graveyard. So I can kind of see their point. Though it begs the question as to why they accepted the invite in the first place if they knew this was what they were getting into. Meanwhile, our other hero, Jen. Bet you forgot about her. I sure did. Jen begins her job hunt, who is literally willing to do, quote, anything. I'll take any kind of job. Well, here's, here's, these are going to be arc words for the rest of the episode. She starts off by asking about the front desk, but eventually works her way into the casino to see about doing some, maybe, cocktail waitressing. Here's what tweaks me out about it. In a confessional, Jen says that she did hair in Portland. I was a hairstylist in Portland, but... So my question is, why wouldn't you go for your bread and butter? It's a glamour town. Oh no, you should be doing something much more. Glamour. Total glamour. Large or small casino stylist or independent stylist. Did she not bring her gear? Question still remain. Is she not interested in renting a chair? I'm assuming this bit's either a little bit scripted or Jen might just be the biggest dummy we've met on this show. While we're in the casino with Jen, we meet... Oh, I don't know what the hell his name is. Uh, hang on, let me check. Oh, Ernie. Apparently, he's a personal party planner, which basically boils down to, hey, you want a pretty girl to walk around with you all night and whatever? Pay me, and I'll bring you a blonde one. And yes, his focus is explicitly on the blonde ones, because he bypasses all these attractive brunettes in order to recruit Jen specifically. Basically, he's running an escort service without calling it an escort service. In fact, he quite literally calls his entourage the Blonde Entourage. She could be part of our Blonde Entourage. Anyway, that nonsense goes on for some time. Ernie says some creepy things, like, 
Girls like Jen are in their most vulnerable states. He's super creepy and hyper-specific about it, too. I'm pretty convinced that by the music, if she went in his car, she'd be getting pimped out. And not in the cool exhibit way. And back to the high rollers, who don't seem to care what's happening. They aren't playing. Tim and Tom aren't happy about it, so Tim goes upstairs to strong-arm these guys into playing. We never see them get confronted. Their next scene is actually them coming downstairs to womanize. Which I wouldn't be against normally, but they do it with absolutely no style. It's not charming, it's not flirting, there's no consent, it's a straight-up sexual harassment. And they play a little bit of slots, I guess. Sim still isn't excited. He eventually invites him down for a personally dealt blackjack game. I think it would be kind of cool to play blackjack with the owner of the casino in that regard, so I think that's something they should have jumped on. Oh, hey, look, it's the blackjack dealer again from episode two. Uh, Tommy was his name, I think. His dad's the VIP host. Tommy thinks he's cool, but he's actually presented as being pretty grating in this episode. I guess he gets pranked or whatever, but nobody cares whatever happens. Also, he tries to ask his pit boss and direct supervisor Monique out on a date, I think? I pack a strong game underneath it all, Monique. What are you doing after work? <laughs> being a businesswoman, Monique rightfully declines. And so Tommy starts drama. Monique rightfully has none of it, and Tommy is still being kind of a tool about it. And mistakes her professionalism for jerkiness. So Tommy decides to go cry to his dad because he doesn't want to put up with it. Tom, it's not about having an in. It's about you doing this by yourself. His dad won't have any of his BS either and tells Tommy to sack up and be a professional. Apply for the job you want. Just a side note for Tommy in this little interaction here, I kind of feel like this interaction was kind of played up for the show. Neither he nor Monique seem that into this bizarre interaction. They look terribly uncomfortable doing it. Tom, for some reason, is hanging out at Zach's with the lounge singer Matt Dusk. Jen, who's fresh off of rejection, weasels her way to the table. Tom rightfully blows her off because she's just a regular guest and he's the owner who has a ton of stuff to do. Though he still decides to introduce her to Matt Dusk anyway, who she admires and apparently has admired for years. Joe decides to capitalize on this sudden fangirl and turn Matt's well-rehearsed and planned out performance into a karaoke game. Matt legitimately doesn't give a damn anymore and just lets it happen. Because I'll just put anybody on stage who wants to sing. So Jen rolls up, tells the band she doesn't know anything about them, but she really, really wants to sing. Matt gives in easily, despite this young lady having no respect for his art form, and invites her to practice. Jen shows up to the practice and quite logically realizes that she hasn't done half the work of a professional singer who's been practicing and working at this his entire life. So it intimidates the hell out of her to get on the stage with a professional when she has no natural talent of her own and hasn't put in any hard work whatsoever. But she gets up there anyway because she has to prove herself, I guess? But I didn't care because I had to get up there and I had to do it. I had to prove to myself I could do it. Again, she just got out of cosmetology school and everything. Is there a reason she wouldn't go get a cosmetology gig in Las Vegas of all places? I'll give Jen some credit for trying, and she's not a horrid singer, but she's very clearly both untrained and doesn't have a lot of natural talent for the art. I'm sure she'd be a contender with lots of practice and coaching, but there's no way in hell she'll be able to keep up with Dusk and the boys by curtain call in a week, nevertheless six hours, which is all she has. Dusk rightfully voices his concerns to Joe, and Joe, for some inexplicable reason, continues to blow him off like you did last time. I'm sensing a pattern here. Hi, Grandma. I need you to start from the, from the beginning, Grandma. Jen calls up her grandmother again and learns a song. Grandma is a good singer, and I feel like Jen would be too if she wasn't discount Paris Hilton. What do you want, Monique? First of all, I'm not your woman. I'm Monique. We come back from commercial and realize that Tommy is being a jackass. Monique pulls him aside to coach him as a professional because she's his boss and it's her job, although Tommy continues to be a tool. For some reason, when someone has a legitimate concern about professionalism on the show, the person they're interacting with has to be a jerk, and the show treats them like they were in the right, because there's no professionalism in Vegas, evidently? Tommy clearly and apparently doesn't think that Blackjack Dealer is a real job and should be fired on the spot. I read comments about how mean Monique is, but this is the service industry and professionalism is a big part of the job. So I really feel bad for her when Tommy gets to run around and be an asshat for no reason. If she was tyrannical and overbearing, it would be one thing. But every conversation she's had with him has been pretty reasonable. So I'm not sure what Tommy's deal is. Ultimately, he decides to go see Tim about being a host. But Tim blows him off because he's too busy trying to make money from those high rollers from earlier. So Tommy's story ends here. And he has to eat some humble pie. Okay, we'll finish off Matt and Jen's story here, because it's functionally the same story from here on out. 
Jen shows up for the show. She's dressed to the nines and ready to kick some butt. Matt's manager reminds her not to putz it up because she doesn't get around too. Jen is a little shocked, but Matt smooths it over because he's Canadian and handsome. They do the song, and it goes about as well as it should. It's kind of like a fan going on stage at a KISS concert, but the difference is that at a concert you're only up there for one song, and everybody knows you're a regular fan and that you're just there for fun, so no one expects it to sound good, it's just supposed to be fun. Now this looked like Jen was a regular part of the act, and it just kind of made Jen and Matt look bad because Jen was not a good singer here. Matt runs off stage, probably to drown himself. Matt isn't mad at her, he's just very disappointed he had to deal with this nonsense. Hi, Grandma! Jen goes outside to cry to her grandma and complain that she has no idea what to do for work, even though she's a perfectly good licensed cosmetologist. Jen decides, instead of asking about the salon, to talk to the pimp instead. She still somehow doesn't know that Ernie's a pimp. Perhaps the lack of purple suit and hat confused her. So she gets pimped out to some high roller in a cowboy hat. Because being pretty for a bored, lonely, rich guy can't possibly go wrong. I guess the blackjack dealer is somewhat involved too, because she's watching Jen for some reason, but nobody really cares. The problem is there's nothing I can do. I just deal the cards. Anyway, the big cowboy creepily sniffs her fingers, and she still doesn't catch on. The pimp gets kicked out because he's a host for another casino or something, I don't know. Meanwhile, the big fish in the cowboy hat tries to buy off Jen to go watch some TV, if you know what I mean. Jen finally catches on and dips. She's not touching that antenna today, not for any amount of money. Somehow, 17 years later, she can hear what I've been shouting at the screen this whole time. I'm a hairstylist. I'm not a hooker. She says that she's a hairstylist and nothing else. She complains about being something that she's not, even though she's deliberately been trying to be something that she's not this entire episode. Some lady at the bar gives her a lecture or a pep talk, I can't really tell which, at a casino bar. I guess it really doesn't matter because it's happening at a casino bar. And then I guess she leaves forever. The moral of the story here is, if you have a license at something, use it until you can comfortably start doing something else. All right, Spinners and Sharks, that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed today's review and found it informative, I'd appreciate a like, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. We're going to be back in Vegas for the whole rest of the week here, so don't expect episode four until sometime next week. So, until next time, though, this is Ace of Vegas signing out, wishing you all strong hands, and, of course, happy spinning, you guys. Viva Ace of Vegas. Viva Ace of Vegas. Viva Viva, viva, it's a big